All righty, it's 102, so I believe we can get started here. Uh, first off, wanted to remind everyone you are muted, but if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to send them to me via the chat feature in the WebEx program. My name is Adam Timmerman, and I'm with the Kansas City Chamber. Uh, once again, thank you all for joining us today. We are very appreciative you were able to spend some time with us to talk about uh, some new available resources uh, that are available to you and your businesses during this time. Uh, a few weeks ago, Congress and the President passed the CARES Act, which stands for the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. We have done numerous uh, webinars on the probably the most famous part of the CARES Act, the Paycheck Protection Program. But this presentation, we're gonna focus on something a little different. Uh, through the CARES Act, there were numerous changes to uh, tax opportunities and tax policy and regulations for uh, businesses and individuals coming out of the bill. Uh, there are some new tax credits available and some new deferral opportunities. Uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail That's because that's why we have the great team of KPMG joining us today to give you those details. Uh, joining us is Mike Bruce, uh, tax partner at KPMG here at Kansas City. He has over 20 years of experience uh, working with clients on tax consulting, restructuring, and compliance matters with a focus of assisting them uh, with the implementation of recent tax, tax law changes. Uh, joining Mike is Clark Seaman, who is a senior manager of, in the business tax service practice uh, at KPMG. I'll make sure I get those initials correct. Uh, since joining the firm in 2011, he has experienced, he has experience in providing tax compliance and consulting Services focusing on privately held business. And also joining us is Keith Kirsch, who's a senior manager at KPMG uh, through their business tax service practice here at Kansas City as well, who also has over 10 years of experience uh, working on large scale consulting, compliance, and provision engagements for pass through and corporate entities. Uh, so at this time, I will turn it over to those three to update you guys on what has changed regarding tax policy in the CARES Act. Uh, I'm going to turn my screen off, but if you need anything, feel free to chat. We'll get your questions asked during the Q&A at the end. Thank you so much. Mike, uh, Clark, and Keith, take it away. All right. Adam, Adam thank you. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining and allowing us to be here with you today. Um, uh, as far as the agenda goes, wanted to hit on on some items that are applicable to um, the employers and, the, and some business considerations. And so we'll we'll go through that. but. A couple of opening comments. Um, the information we're going to talk about today is intentionally going to be high level. There were numerous changes uh, impacting various different different areas of a business, and so we're going to try to hit on those which we think is is most appropriate for for this group. Uh, you know, there were eight, over 800 pages of legislation, and so we we tried to decipher all that down to a concise uh, discussion. So it's it's high level uh, on purpose. You're going to have our contact information at the end of the slide deck, and so please feel free to reach out to us if, if you have have any questions. Um, and it's probably more for the business considerations, but there's there's a lot of moving parts. You know, change one one tax aspect or one assumption that could have a rippling effect through other other areas of of the tax profile and attributes. So. What we always recommend to our clients is to do a robust modeling process to ensure the whole picture. Is, is considered um, probably an obvious statement, but you may hear us, you know, mention modeling a couple times. And when you have complex legislation like this that has some drastic changes to your tax profile, it's important to be sure that you're thinking of of all the moving parts and and the areas that it could impact. And then and then finally, Adam referenced the chat section. Uh, we encourage questions throughout. Uh, we'll have a Q and A session at the end. But if you have a question that's that's on point with with a topic, please feel free to to, um, to ask that question. You know, I'd like to have as much of a, of a conversation if possible uh, on this venue. Um, but please feel free to ask questions. And if it's a fact specific question, you know, we're happy to take those offline. Again, you're going to have our, um, our our contact information and ha and happy to uh, to discuss any questions with you. Uh, so before we get into the, the meat of the presentation, as Adam said. They've had webinars on on the SBA loan profile. You know, with with the PPP getting extended in the very near future, another three hundred and ten million dollars. Thought it might be helpful. I think it's a good slide that compares the PPP 
with the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, the EIDL. Um, we won't go into this in detail because I know you've all been exposed to this, but I think this is a, a good reference material. And then uh, finally, before we get into some of the employer considerations, um, I, I think this is a good slide that really gets into some of the details of the PPP. So for those that may not have analyzed it yet or haven't got the funding, uh, there's there's some information here that might be helpful. Um, and then and then finally, um, everybody is familiar with this as well. But as far as the, the, the deadlines go uh, for filing tax returns, those obviously have been extended out. And so this this may be a good reference for you um, to look at when you think about your filing requirements and your cash flow requirements. Um, no cash flow for any April after uh, for any April 15th due date is required until the 15th. And so that would include individual first quarter and second quarter estimated payments. So um, this this topic that we're going to talk about is going to be mainly focused on on the corporate aspect. There's a webinar next week uh, sponsored by the chamber that's going to hit on the individual aspects of that. So we intentionally did not go into detail on those. But again, if you have a, a question that is important to you, I'm very happy to talk about that as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Clark, uh, Clark Seaman, and he's going to talk about some of the employer considerations and, and related credits. Thanks, Mike. Uh, for the next slide, well, the next slide here is a, a summary of the different items I'll kind of touch on as we go through. The first section I'm going to focus on are a handful of various payroll credits that are available to businesses, um, kind of how you fall into those credits and how they can be used. Uh, we'll get into covering a little bit on the payroll tax deferral that's available to businesses as well and what that looks like. Um, and then quickly touch on something that wasn't included in the CARES Act, um, but is applicable in the section 139. So jumping into the employer retention credits, um, this credit's available for employers to receive a 50% credit um, on qualified wages up to $10,000 in wages. So the max credit available would be would be $5,000. This will be for wages paid between March 13th, the start of a kind of disaster to date, and then going through the end of the year. And, and this credit's available to use against Social Security taxes, as well as other um, employment taxes that a business could be paying. And one item to note, uh, I'll mention this multiple times as well, is that wages used under the employee retention credit aren't available to be used against the work opportunity tax credits or other leave credits that I'll be covering um, as well. And then one other important item on this credit is that if you weren't able to receive, receive the payroll protection funding um, as part of the CARES Act, you would not be eligible for this, for this credit. And so kind of getting into the mechanics of the credit and who would be eligible. Um, an eligible employer is there's two two tests, it's an or test to determine if you're eligible. And so the first would be you would look to see that either your operations were suspended fully or partially as a result of a government order, or that you had a 50% reduction in your quarterly receipts year over year. And the, the second one's a little bit more of a bright line test, easier to identify. However, the first one's a little bit more ambiguous where um, determining if you're partially suspended as a result of a government order is a little bit of a gray area and we're expecting additional guidance from IRS on this area um, in the coming days. However, you know, a couple of examples might be where you can be partially suspended if a portion of your workforce was able to only work at 50% capacity. Um, another example might be that you have a portion of your workforce working at 100%. However, you have a handful of employees that are unable to work at all. And so a couple of examples of being partially suspended, but you know, look to the additional guidance coming out in the coming days from the IRS on more clarity there. And then once you've jumped over the hurdle of being an eligible employer, you look to see if you have fewer than or more than 100 employees. That's the benchmark that they accept in this credit and it kind of falls into two separate buckets. If you have fewer than 100 employees, wages paid to all your employees would be a qualified wage and eligible for the credit. Up 
to the ten thousand dollar cap, and so that would mean you could give up to a five thousand dollar credit. If you have more than hundred employees, the qualified wages are a little bit more stringent, and so those wages are only paid for an employee that is unable to provide services, and those would be the only wages that would qualify. So if you have an employee that's working fifty percent capacity only. Half their wages would qualify for the retention. Things might just go on to the next slide. So going from the retention credit to the next, the next two under the emergency paid sick need and emergency paid FMLA. These two are correlate uh, with each other where they're but a little, they have a couple of different nuances between the two, and so we'll, we'll go through those. These credits are available to employers with fewer than 500 employees. Um, and one item to note is that the count of your employees is determined on the day that a particular employee begins their leave. And so if you're kind of right along, straddling the line of 500 employees, or if you were to have more than 500 employees, at the beginning of the crisis, and as time goes along, the workforce were to, were to shrink under the 500 employees, you would fall into this category uh, of credits. And so, first covering the emergency paid sick leave, uh, this is available to employees on day one of their employment. Uh, it can be used up to, to cover up to two weeks or 10 days of, of work. Um, there's a handful of triggers that we'll cover on the next slide that will determine the amount of the credit. But in general, there's, there's two levels of the credit. Either full pay, which would be capped at $511 daily for a max credit of $5,100, or two thirds of pay capped at $200 a day, $2,000 of total. The, the second credit is emergency paid FMLA. And this one's a little bit different than the emergency paid sick leave. The first difference is that the employee is only eligible for this after they've been in the court for 30 days. Um, another difference is this one, it can go up to 12 weeks worth of pay. However, there's a 10 day waiting period before the counts, the counts start. And there's only one trigger. It's, it overlaps with the emergency paid sick leave, which we'll cover. And uh, it's only credit is the two thirds pay capped at $200 up to $10,000. And so the so looking at the different triggers, um, you'll see that the emergency paid sick leave has, um, has the six there on the left. And so the first, the first three are the three that would qualify for the credit of $511 per day. And those would be when the employee themselves are subject to a quarantine. Um, whether that be via an order or uh, advised by a healthcare provider, or even if the employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID and is seeking a diagnosis, uh, if they were to be paid out through the emergency pay sick leave program for that time, they would qualify for that $511. The next two are if your employee is caring for an individual or caring for their, their children who aren't able to go to school or child care facility due to COVID. And so if that's the case, uh, those, these two triggers would fall into the second bucket where if you were paying them, uh, they would be able to receive a credit for two thirds of the pay capped at $200 per day. And the last trigger there is if the employee would be you know, experiencing similar symptoms as specified by Health and Human Services, and they would request that emergency paid sick. In contrast, when looking at the FMLA Plus, the, um, the one trigger would be is only that if the employee is unable to work due to caring for a minor child. Um, their school is closed or that their health care facility is closed. When thinking through some of the wages for these credits, there's um, provisions in place where the wages 
again, can be double dipped between you know, these two credits, which is a retention credit. Um, one item to note, though, is that the, the wages are being capped at two thirds pay. Um, and you're paying more than that $200, or if their full pay is more than the $511 cap per day, those excess wages that aren't being used for these credits would be available to be used under the employee retention program. Uh, but the main key is to make sure that you're not using the wages to play in multiple places. Moving on from the credits to the, the payroll tax deferral, I'm sure your payroll tax provider may have reached out, uh, reached out to you on this, but I kind of just to go through and to reiterate. Um, you are, employers are eligible to defer the, the payment of their social security taxes um, for the next two years. And so any social security taxes that would be deposited between March 27th and December 31st, 2020 would be able to be deferred. Uh, and that would also include um, if you're a self-employed individual could include uh, half of the 12.4% of super tax. So uh, some benefit there for self-employed individuals as well. Any amount that is deferred uh, would be payable 50% on December 31st of 2021 and 50 the other 50% on December 31st of 2022. Um, one item to note, kind of thinking through the deductibility of those tax payments, uh, given that the cash isn't being paid out until later years, uh, while the uh, your company's books may deduct them currently in 2022, from a tax perspective, those, those taxes wouldn't be deductible until they're paid in 2021 or 2022. And, and there's some interplay here as well with the PPP loans, where if you receive a PPP loan, you're still a eligible to defer your payroll taxes up until the point you receive notice that your loan will be forgiven. If you do receive a forgiveness of your loan, um, at that point, you will no longer be able to defer taxes when you start currently paying them again. So there is some deferral available even if you have received PPP funding. However, once that loan was forgiven, um, again, you wouldn't be able to defer any taxes. And I think the, the last item I was going to cover from an employer perspective, um, again, this isn't something that was passed within the CARES Act, but something that's applicable since we're in a disaster zone at a federal level. And so Section 139 allows for employers to pay an employee a disaster, a qualified disaster relief payment, and that, that payment would be excluded from gross income of the employee and would not be subject to any federal payroll taxes. And the definition of a qualified disaster relief payment, as you can see there, is uh, any amount paid that is reasonable and necessary for a personal family living and the funeral expenses. You know, obviously, if, if those expenses are covered under insurance or you're reimbursed by any, by any other means, then they wouldn't qualify for the disaster relief payment. Um, and also, you know, those payments can't replace an employee's kind of normal wages. They'd be above and beyond the normal wages that an employee would be. I think with that, I will pass it off to Keith to cover the income tax considerations for this. You with I, think us? We're good to keep, I think we're good to keep moving. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bear with me one second. Um, yeah, Keith, we can't hear you. I know you're talking. We can't hear you. I don't know if you're on mute or Adam, can you see if he's muted on your side? I'll double check quick. Ah. Uh, how about now? There you are. Here you, Keith. There you go. All 
right. So thanks, Clark. Hi, everyone. I hope you all are staying healthy and safe. I will be going over the business income tax provisions of the CARES Act. Uh, specifically, I'll be going over the rules uh, involving qualified improvement property, uh, net operating losses, minimum tax credits, interest expense limitations, and I will also touch on uh, disaster losses. And as Mike alluded to, um, all these changes are kind of interrelated. So I think about how these changes are going to impact uh, your tax position. Keep in mind, there may be some indirect negative tax consequences um, to other provisions. So it's extremely important to model out the various scenarios to understand the ultimate tax impact on, on your company. And so the first topic I'll be discussing is the technical correction to qualified improvement property. And just to provide a little background on this, um, as part of tax reform, Treasury created a, a new term called qualified improvement property. Uh, they took what was previously qualified leasehold improvement property, qualified restaurant property, and qualified retail improvement property into this one uh, QIP classification. Now, QIP is any improvement to an interior of a non-residential building that is placed in service after the building's initial place in service date, other than improvements to elevators, escalators, building enlargements, uh, and uh, building's internal structural framework. So for example, a qualified improvement property you would include installation of uh, drywall, ceilings, interior doors, fire protection, mechanical and electrical and plumbing. Um, so Treasury and the IRS originally intended for this property to be classified as a 15-year property and eligible for bonus depreciation or immediate expensing. However, uh, qualified improvement property wasn't listed as a 15-year property under the statute, and therefore it defaulted 39-year property and not eligible for bonus. Uh, the CARES Act included a technical correction to fix this and gave QIP a 15-year recovery period and also made it eligible for bonus depreciation. Uh, the provision is effective for assets placed in service after 2017, so taxpayers can, and they're actually required to, go back and change their depreciation method on QIP that was placed in service after 2017. Uh, so for the 2018 tax year and 2019 tax year, if it was already filed, there are a few ways to go back and change this depreciation method. Uh, first way is filing an amended tax return. The second way is to file an automatic method change uh, with form 3115, which allows taxpayers to effectively true up the tax depreciation on the most current tax return or uh, you can file an administrative adjustment request and this is only available for partnerships that are subject to the new BBA rules. From a timing perspective, uh, I'll say generally because there's a lot of nuances to this, um, for amended returns they need to be filed by October 15th, 2021. And uh, if you're going to file a method change, it just needs to be included in, with the next return that is filed. Uh, the IRS provided some relief on depreciation related elections that were made in 2018 and 2019. Um, if a taxpayer elected out of bonus depreciation in 2018 and would like to change that election, the IRS provided some revenue procedures just last Friday. Uh, that allows taxpayers to modify certain bonus depreciation elect elections uh, through an amended return or an automatic change. Uh, the last thing I'd like to bring up with respect to qualified improved property um, is the real estate election uh, related to the interest expense limitation or 163J. Uh, real property trades or businesses could elect out of the interest expense limitation rules and instead a depreciate real property under straight line ABS, which slows down depreciation for that property. Uh, QIP has a 20 year ABS class life and is not eligible for bonus, uh, not eligible for bonus depreciation under this election. 
Uh, the IRS recently provided relief for taxpayers to make or withdraw a real property election with an amended tax return. So for companies that had a significant amount of QIP in 2018 and made the real property election, uh, revoking this election may result in a, in a tax benefit. All right, the, the next topic I'll be discussing is the provision that uh, impacted the net operating losses. So the CARES Act modified the NOL rules for NOLs that are generated after 12-31-2017 and before 1-1-2021 to allow NOLs to be carried back five years. So as a result, we kind of have three buckets of federal NOLs as shown on this table uh, in the slide. So the first bucket is the NOLs generated on or before 12-31-2017. And these are the uh, pre-tax reform NOLs. And these can be carried back two years and carried forward 20 years. Uh, and you can utilize the NOL to offset 100% of taxable income. Uh, the second bucket of NOLs, these are the NOLs that were generated after 12-31-2017 and before 2021. And these are eligible to be carried back five years and have an indefinite carry forward period. Now, prior to the CARES Act, uh, these NOLs could only offset 80% of taxable income. However, the CARES Act temporarily suspends the 80% of taxable income limitation on use of these NOLs, but only through 2020. So after that, the NOLs will be subject to the 80% of taxable income uh, limitation. So starting in 2021, these NOLs will be subject to the 80% limitation. The last bucket of NOL or NOL is generated beginning on or after 1-1 of 2021, and these cannot be carried back and have the 80% of taxable income limitation, but they can be carried forward indefinitely. Let me go to the next slide. So for the second bucket of NOL, the NOLs that are generated in 2018-2020, the extended carryback provision creates a potential significant benefit because you can carry back losses to offset income that was potentially taxed at 35% and generate a current tax refund. This emphasizes the importance of investigating tax planning strategies to accelerate deductions in these years in order to maximize the carryback potential. You can do this by looking into various method changes. Uh, you can elect to claim disaster losses under 165I, uh, which I'll be discussing later. Uh, you can change your tax year end. Uh, there are a lot of different strategies to consider to maximize the, the benefit here. Um, it should be noted that carrying back NOLs could require taxpayers to, yeah, um, it could require taxpayers to recalculate certain items and, and may result in some negative tax consequences. Um, you may need to recalculate 163J or interest expense limitation. Uh, for taxpayers of foreign operations, the 250 deduction for guilty and FIDI has taxable income limitations. So for 2018 and 2019, NLLs may eliminate some of that Section 250 benefit. Um, if you carry back an NOL to an early year to 2000 to 2017, there may be some AMT implications as well. Uh, also worth pointing out that for taxpayers with foreign operations, there can be some unfavorable interactions when carrying back, uh, when carrying back the NML to 965 inclusion year, but the CARES Act allows for a taxpayer to skip over the 965 years but should be noted that it doesn't extend the overall carryback period. You just get to skip over those, those 965 years. Uh, taxpayers can also elect to forego the entire carryback period. And to make this election for 2018 and 2019, a waiver needs to be filed with the first return filed after the enactment, uh, which is March 27th, I believe. And then for 2020, it just needs to be included with the return that's filed. 
also wanted to point out there's a, there was a minor technical correction that was made to the NOL Care Act um, for the NOLs uh, for fiscal year filers that had an NOL the 2017 through the 2018 tax year, or what we call the straddle period. Um, under the tax reform rules, taxpayers with the tax year straddling 1231 2017 weren't able to carry back losses generated in the straddle year because tax reform provision that terminated the ability to carry back the NOLs applied to losses in tax years ending after 1231 2017. So if a taxpayer had a 131 tax year end and had a loss for the tax year ending 131 2018, it couldn't carry back that loss, but the CARES Act fixes that so that the NOLs that arose in the tax year straddling 1231-2017 are eligible for the two-year carryback period. Um, the last item on NOLs and to move forward, just how to create the, uh, the, the carryback. Generally, the way to carry back a corporate NOL is on form 1139, which is the application for a tentative refund or to amend the tax return. Generally, an 1139 is a simpler process, but you kind of have a limited amount of time on that. Um, before, yet 12 months after the close of the tax year, to file an 1139, but the IRS granted a six-month extension on that. So for 2008 calendar year taxpayers, the due date would be June 30th, 2018. All right, so the next topic is AMT uh, carry forwards for corporate taxpayers. Um, a little background on this as well. Um, pre tax reform, uh, corporate tax credit payers could generate AMT credits in certain circumstances. Um, corporate AMT, however, was repealed by tax reform for tax years beginning after 12 31 2017. There were certain transition rules put in place uh, so that corporate taxpayers could utilize 100% of their AMT credits before 2022. So for 2018, 19, and 20, taxpayers could claim a refundable credit equal to 50% of the excess of the AMT credit over the amount otherwise allowable for the year against the regular tax liability. And then 100% was ultimately refunded, refundable in 2020. Uh, now, with the CARES Act, taxpayers uh, can get 100% of that credit refunded in 2019. Um, also, taxpayers can elect to claim 100% of the credit in 2018. So you can file an 1139, what we talked about with the NOLs, uh, now to claim a refund for 100% of your AMT credit in 2018, if you had any amount being carried forward to 2019, rather than waiting for your uh, 2019 tax return to be complete, just the way you can get cash a little quicker if you have any AMT credits uh, being carried forward. Now, there's clearly some interaction with NOL carryback rules as well. Uh, there's lots of nuances and we can't get into all of them right now, but one example is if a taxpayer fully utilized uh, AMT credits to offset their 2018 regular tax liability and there's a loss in 2019 that can be carried back to 2018, you may be due a refund since the annual carry back could eliminate all or some of the 2018 tax liability. Final point on the AMT credits, um, if you had a company that closed down in 2018 and forfeited, forfeited any of the AMT credits, uh, these can now be claimed and refunded. other uh, business provisions. Uh, there were some changes to the interest expense disallowance rules. 
Before the CARES Act, for certain taxpayers, interest expense was limited to 30% of adjusted taxable income. Uh, this is your effectively your, your tax EBITDA through 2021 and tax EBIT started in, in 2022. The CARES Act temporarily increased the 30% limit on adjusted taxable income to 50% for 2019 and 2020. With the exception for partnerships, the limitation uh, for partnerships in 2019 is 30% of ATI, but 50% of ATI in 2020. But if a partnership has any disallowed interest in 2019, its partners can deduct 50% of that interest in 2020 regardless of what, whether they had any ATI in 2020. Also important to note that in 2020, all taxpayers can elect to use ATI from 2019 in computing their interest expense limitation in 2020. I think the, with the logic that this would result in a larger deduction for taxpayers uh, expecting to have reduced uh, 2020 earnings. Um, the next topic is that business loss limitations. This is more applicable to individuals. I'll quickly touch on this. Um, the, the CARES Act repeals the excess business loss rules under 461 L for 2018, 19, and 20. So individual taxpayers can deduct business losses in excess of $250,000 or $500,000 or if they're filing married a filing joint uh, for 2018, uh, 19, and 20. Any taxpayers uh, that had losses subject to the limitation in 2018 can amend their returns in their 2019 returns if they already filed their 2019 returns. And this is particularly beneficial for real estate folks that uh, might receive significant depreciation deductions, but should be noted that the passive loss rules uh, still apply here. Okay, so the next topic is disaster losses under uh, section 165I. Um, not, this is not part of the CARES Act, but it's very relevant now. Um, section 165 permits taxpayers to claim certain losses um, in a tax year immediately preceding uh, the tax year in which the loss is sustained. So said another way, if a taxpayer incurs one of these losses in 2020, they can elect to claim that loss in 2019. Uh, this is very dependent on your facts and circumstances. So if you think you have this, I, I definitely suggest that you reach out to your tax advisor or you know, we're, we're happy to help as well. Uh, the eligibility requirements for this is that the has to declare an emergency or disaster under the Stafford Act and then in the area affected. Uh, the taxpayer sustains and otherwise deductible losses within that area, and then the loss is attributable uh, to declare a disaster. So you need to be able to tie that loss into the disaster um, at hand. Um, so this is applicable now because President Trump uh, declared COVID-19 a national emergency pursuant to the Stafford Act, and the declaration covers the entire U.S. So this effectively turns on section 165I for almost all taxpayers. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is just some examples of the types of losses that are eligible for 165I, um, abandonment of leasehold improvements, uh, sale of business property at a loss, uh, worthless securities, just when you're thinking about these types of losses and whether or not you want to claim them in 2019, just remember you got to be able to tie that loss um, into the the natural disaster that's been that's been declared. And that, that's Adam, all. I think that so. Too good. Uh, sorry, Keith. Adam, I think that brings us to the end of our 
planned comments. Um, and we had hoped to 15 minutes of Q&A time, which it looks like we're right on time. So happy to answer any questions that may be out there. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, we appreciate that. If you have any questions, pre please send them via the chat feature. Uh, I just wanted to go back quickly to the employer retention credit uh, section. Um, make sure I heard it correctly. You said you are not eligible for this credit if you've received a loan under payroll protection, correct? That that that, that is correct. Um, let, let me restate those rules real quick. So for the retention credit, if you get the loan, then you are not eligible for the retention credit. Under the defer, you can defer your payroll taxes as if you have the loan, but as soon as that loan becomes forgiven, then then, uh, then those payroll taxes become due. All right, thank you for that. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the in the chat feature. Um, uh, here, I got a good question there. And what happens if you had payroll paid after closure, but before uh, paycheck protection was received? You still be eligible. If you had payroll, go go that one more time, Adam, please. If you had payroll paid after closure, uh, but before EPP was received, would you still be eligible or not? Yeah, no, no. Once you receive the PPP, uh, you would not would not be eligible for that. And there's recapture provisions that would come into play um, if you receive the PPP. Say, say you you, you claim the retention credit for uh for the first quarter that would be filed on your april um your april 941 and then you got the ppp sometime before june 30th there would be recapture provisions which would, would make you recapture that retention credit thank you um if you have any questions feel free to enter them Sorry, i'm sifting through a couple of them right now trying to find them um In, there, in the meantime, as I get these sorted, I apologize. Uh, are there any more quick points you guys want to point out regarding what you just covered? I know there's a lot of information for our attendees. Yeah, there is there's a lot of information. And the only thing I'll point out is that, as Keith mentioned, we had guidance come out as early as last Friday. We can see the guidance. We're expecting guidance out from the IRS on the PP, on, I'm sorry, on retention credit. Um, and so it is a very fluid uh, environment that we're in now. And so everything that we said today is effective as of, you know, April 23rd, but we do expect, you know, more guidance and more changes. Um, we do not expect with the passage of the, with the refunding of the PPP, which is forthcoming, we don't expect to have any significant tax law changes there. Um, but, you know, round four is coming and and we don't have any speculation as to what, what that could, that could entail if there even is a round four. Um, so I would just encourage people to uh, uh, to say uh, fluid in their in their tax planning, work with their tax advisor to make sure that, that they're using the latest and greatest tax rules um, because it, it is it is a fluid environment. Thank you. Um, with PPP being meant for eight weeks, essentially a payroll. Um, are there any concerns about these credits to extend them after the eight weeks, or are they? You know, can you apply for them once the eight weeks are up, or if we're still in a payroll, or you know, just with the eight weeks time period, what does it look like with these changes uh, in tax law versus uh, pay, what, how long PPP is supposed to last? Yeah, so the application deadline for the PPP is June thirtieth, and so um, the next the next funding is three hundred ten billion dollars, which is expected to be approved. You know today, tomorrow, sometime in the very near future, we believe, um, or the commentators believe. And so as long as the funds are available, um, you know, you have until June 30th. I will say that I know a lot of financial institutions uh, that, I, that I've talked to continue to take applications, even though the, the first funding had been exhausted with the anticipation of, of new funding. And so if, if somebody is considering the PPP program, I would encourage them to 
uh, to work with their financial institution to get their application in because I know it is it is going to be um, uh, it, it is going to be a competitive not a competitive process but it's going to be a, a time sensitive process. Um, well, being that uh, PPP is supposed to be spent within that eight weeks, you know, if, if you get the loan, you have eight weeks to pay it. Um, if you have a business that's closed, you're supposed to pay seven, to get the loan forgiveness. You're supposed to pay the seventy five percent of the payroll within those eight weeks. Eight, eight weeks, mm -hmm. not weeks. Um, you know, being that if a business is closed, that's kind of difficult to do. Uh, do you have any recommendations or suggestions about that? Uh, I think that's probably a facts and circumstances situation there, Adam. I, I think if you look at it and the business closed and they don't meet the other requirements for forgiveness, then, then my my reaction would be that, that that loan would would not be forgiven and would require to be repaid. Um, but probably one of those facts and circumstances you need to understand exactly what what fact pattern we're working with. Thank you. And if you anyone else has any more questions, feel free to keep uh, sending them in the chat. Um, all right, I just had one here. And I lost it. I scrolled out of it. <laughs> this is my mistake. I apologize. Um, I apologize. I seem to have lost my question. Um, so, if anyone has any one other questions, feel free to send them. Um, if not, we can uh, begin to start wrapping up here. If that's okay with everyone, I, I do apologize. Yeah, that's my mistake. Um, no problem, Adam. If questions surface after after this, um, the they will have our, well. There's our contact information right there. Yep. We'll feel free to give us a call. And we can be happy to talk about anything that we chatted about today in this in this discussion. And if you have any fact specific scenarios, happy to uh, give you some informal thoughts on those as well. Appreciate that. I do apologize. Um, I'm sure we have some technical questions. Uh, you guys went over a lot of information. But we do appreciate you doing that. There's been a lot of changes in the last couple of weeks, with everything happening. So I know that we are appreciative that everyone the call is appreciative of the information you guys provided. Uh, there's a lot to navigate, there's a lot to do, there's a lot to learn from. So we do appreciate uh, your guys' time joining us and we appreciate all the great information KPMG is providing out to the community. Uh, but if, with, with that, we'll start wrapping it up. If anyone has any questions for our speakers, their contact information is uh, on the screen or you can ask me and I can relay their questions to, to them as well. Um, we do have upcoming webinars, so I do recommend you check the Chamber's calendar uh, for upcoming events. We have one on Monday with Congresswoman Sharice Davids, and then we have one next Wednesday about individual taxes uh, since uh, COVID-19, how they have changed. Um, and if you have any ideas regarding webinars and what you think the Chamber should do, feel free to send them over. We're always happy to take suggestions and um, share any bit of information you all think is relevant to during this time. And, uh, uh, to wrap it up, I thank you again for sharing your afternoon with us. And if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out. We are always happy to serve you and uh, answer as much as we can. Thank you so much, everyone.